I'd like for you to take the Word of God, please, and turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in just a moment in Philippians chapter 4. And I speak to this wonderful graduating group on the learning process. You may think you have it down already, but I'd like to give this bit of help to you and do the best I can with this idea of the learning process as you go through this learning process. The Apostle Paul with pen in hand writes to the church in Philippi in chapter four, beginning with verse five, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this expression, if you would, please. In verse 9, ye have learned. Ye have learned. You've gone through a certain process, and this is what you've learned. And then, if you'll notice carefully in verse 11, I have learned. I have learned. The truth of the matter is, if you're going to teach others, and that's what we're commanded to do, to be able to teach others also, you have to learn. God has created us so that we can be taught. Think of that. When the Lord designed mankind, he designed us so that we could communicate with him and he could communicate with us and we could communicate with one another. That's an amazing thing. There are many people who never communicate with God and never allow God to communicate with them. And the communication, therefore, that they have with one another is less than worthless. It points no one to the best, to God, to the things of God. But there is a learning process now that we've been created to learn. The Bible is God's revelation of himself. He wants and desires to reveal himself to us, to learn of him, to know him. If you hold your place here and turn with me to what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy. In the third chapter, as he wrote to Timothy, he said that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. Think of that in verse 13 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know what, standing in the pathway of the onslaught of the most hellish behavior ever in human history, you know the only thing that's standing in the pathway of an awful onslaught of the most hellish behavior in all of human history, the spirit-filled Christian and the spirit-filled church. If it were not, the devil just have his way. And he's having a pretty big time of it now. Think of that. God's word and God's work answers to the world's dilemma. It tells the world in its dilemma what the only real answer happens to be. But can only be given by people who have learned that from the Lord. But there's a learning process. 
Paul writes to Timothy and said, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. If you think it's bad now, let me tell you, it's getting worse because God said it's getting worse. That means for your children and your grandchildren, it'll only be worse. How are you going to combat that? How will you deal with that? We can hide our heads in the sand and wish it were better. We can imagine things being better. We can seek some escape and find a place where it may be better for a while. But the word of God says evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. And so the apostle says in verse 14, but continue thou and the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I love to just dwell on this verse, especially the part of it right in the heart of it where it says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, notice this, and hast been assured of. And hast been assured of. At this juncture in your life, you ought to say, there are some things that I have been assured of. I've learned them, but I'm assured of them. I know this is true. I know this is certain. And the truth and the certainty of these things that I'm assured of gives me urgency to do what God would have me do. Continue down the things which I've learned and has been assured of. If you meet someone along the way that seems convinced about the things of God, I'm not talking about this passive crowd that can take it or leave it, but there are people you will meet who are so convinced of the things of God, they're passionate about it, they have an urgency about them, you better take notice. Something's happened to them. Something stirred them up. It has to do with what they've learned and they've been assured of and what they're going to continue to do. There are times they even seem so radical, so off the wall, so different from the run the mill crowd, you think there's something maybe a little wrong with them. But people need to be stirred up. God's people need to be stirred up for the Lord and the things of God for the right things. Paul wrote to Titus and he said, there are certain things you are to set in order, but there are also certain things you're to avoid. And if we don't learn what we ought to learn, we spend our time setting in order what we should be avoiding and avoiding what we should be setting in order. I see parents who who want to correct things that don't need to be corrected and let things go that should have been corrected. I see ministers in the work of the Lord and I've made these mistakes myself who want to set something in order and it needs to be let go and then they'd let go things that should have been set in order. It all depends on what we have learned and how we've gone through this learning process. It's an important thing. It's vital. It's essential. It is the one thing we've tried to teach you. As a matter of fact, you can't teach everything you want to teach in a college education, but you teach people how to learn other things that they need to know. And he says, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. If I had you now, stop where you are, make a list of the things you're assured of. You're not doubting, you're not wavering. You're assured of these things because you've gone through God's learning process and you know these things to be true. These will guide your life. This will see you through. What would be on your list? What would be on your list? Go back with me, please, to the book of Philippians. I want you to notice this. The apostle writes in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Think. Would you circle that little word, think? Think. But it doesn't stop there. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Would you circle that little word do? It's not just about thinking, it's about doing. 
Jesus gave a warning about hearing and not doing. As a matter of fact, when he told his great stories, parables, the real villains in those parables, the mean people in those parables were not the people who did the horrible things. Just take any parable. Take the parable of the Good Samaritan. A man was wounded and left on the Jericho Road. Thieves wounded him and left him half dead. But when the Lord told that story, who were the villains? The villains were not the people who wounded him and left him half dead. The villains... The real villains were the people who walked by and could have done something to help him, but they didn't. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You see, it's not just thinking about things as, well, I've been to college, I've heard and I've heard and I've heard and I've heard, and you make a long list of what you've heard. But what are you doing with what you've heard? In the learning process, that has to take place, doesn't it? Thinking and doing, thinking and doing. Well, I want you to make a list, just a little list, would you please? In this learning process, first we must learn of his person. His person. Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. It all begins with God. And by the way, everything else we learn comes out of knowing him. Everything. My greatest failure in life, and I've got lots of them. I could be a better husband, a better father, a better grandfather, a better preacher, a better pastor. I could be a better founder and president of this college. And I could find failure there. But my greatest failure in life is that I do not know Jesus Christ like I ought to know him at this stage in my life. I do not know him like I could know him. I wish I understood more about this word moderation. Oh, I tried to find exactly what it meant. Gentleness, long-suffering, Christ-like behavior, God's word says, let your moderation be known unto all men, the way you live your Christian life. It's on display every day. Think about that. It's just out there on display every day. And live with this thought, the Lord is at hand. The Lord's at hand. So in this learning process, the first thing our Lord desires is for us to know him. To know him. Faith is is an action we take, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, but faith is also an attitude we to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Christ. Some people are satisfied to know things. God is not ever satisfied with us knowing just things. He wants us to know him. Think of that. That's in the learning process, to know him. It's not even what do you know about Jesus. <laughs> it's how well do you know him. Turn with me, please, to the gospel according to Matthew just for a moment. And I want you to hear these words. When we read the Bible, it is the word of God. Read it as if you're listening to God as we read the words. In Matthew chapter 11, we come to verses 28, 29, and 30. And the Lord Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29 of Matthew chapter 11. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. Learning of him will bring that rest. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You and I are on a lifelong journey. If we're Christians, if we're truly believers, on a lifelong journey to learn. We are. I got a degree in education when I was at your juncture in life, and I had to learn certain sciences, social sciences, histories, English principles, and 
things like that. But above all else, I was to know the Lord. To know the Lord. The difference in the college I attended, the University of Tennessee and this college, the difference in the college I graduated from, University of Tennessee and this college, is that the bedrock and the foundation is God's word here. Not everything there was bad, but it wasn't given to the Lord. In its beginning, it was. Some fine Presbyterian people wanted to start a school. As a matter of fact, they had orange as a color because it was the Protestant color. It was Scots-Irish. But somewhere they veered from that. And we started this school, and God bless you, you came to it. And you'll walk across this platform and receive a degree. You've finished, and you finish well. But the great knowledge we want you to have is the greatest knowledge of all knowledge. We want you to know God. There's no greater knowledge than that. So in the learning process, don't just strive to learn things. It must begin and end and have everything in the middle all around knowing Christ. Knowing Christ. We must know his person. There's a second thing God desires for us in this learning process. If you turn back with me to Philippians chapter 4, it's easy to identify here. We must know his peace. His peace. The Bible says, let your moderation be known unto all men. Verse 5, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Now there's prayer. There's sort of the telescope of prayer, but there's a microscope of prayer too, your request. Getting specific here. You're getting specific. I don't believe general prayers amount to anything. Nothing is dynamic unless it is specific. Oh, you've learned. And that's the way it's dynamic. God said, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice, please. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, and here's a list. Always look for the Bible list. The things that are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. Would you mark the expression of verse 7? The peace of God. But if we, if we commit these things to the Lord in prayer, if we lean heavily upon the Lord, prayer is not trying to get God to come around to our way of thinking. It's working in our heart to our coming around to God's way of thinking and praying in God's will. But if we do that and think on these things, notice these things, then we go from the peace of God to the source of it all, the God of peace. My spiritual father was a man by the name of Dr. Lee Robertson. I wish you knew him like I got to know him and his great wife, Caroline. She was such a friend and encourager. She was a great friend of my wife. I'm going to give you her life verses. You might want to write a little note about this. This is Mrs. Robertson's life verses. Would you turn to them, please, in Isaiah chapter 26 in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For the Lord Jehovah, in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Often Ms. Robertson would quote that verse, these two together. Let's read it aloud. Would you read it with me? Let's begin, please, with verse 3 of Isaiah 26. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. 
You see, God wants us to learn of him, his person. It's a continual learning of his person. More about Jesus would I know. Always. It's unending. It's continuing. God's revealed himself to us in his word. His revelation is progressive and it becomes perfect in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. We, you want to know about God, what God is like? Look at Christ, the Son of God. And then we learn of peace. It's his peace. His peace. Look at it again. The God of peace, the peace of God. Then there's a third thing. And this is what we need. In this learning process, we learn of his person, we learn of his peace, and we learn of his provision. You're going to step out someday to try to do something like you've never done before. I have these young preachers who've been trained here call me and say, Brother Sexton, pray for me. I'm, we're going to buy a piece of property and we don't have the money to get it, but I believe God wants us to move our building and relocate everything. And we're trying to trust God that he'll, he'll, he'll provide. Well, you, you need to learn of his person and have his peace so you can trust him for his provision. Those stories have been repeated over and over. I remember walking into that Levi Strauss facility and they wanted four and a half million dollars for it and someone said all of our deacons voted that we should relocate the college from this campus to that campus. And so I went in, it took my breath away, 200,000 square feet under one roof. I went in it a second time and tried to pray and ask the Lord. I had to know the Lord to ask the Lord. I was seeking God's peace and the peace of God in it all and the God of peace. And I had to stand on the threshold of all of that and believe that God would provide. It's a journey you will make. It really is. It's a journey you will make, not necessarily by the same buildings and that type of thing, but to learn of his provision. Let's read a little of this. Will you follow along? Verse 10, Philippians 4. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again wherein you were also careful but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want for I have learned in whatsoever state I am there would to be content. What a lesson. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. By the way, the abounding lessons are easier lessons than the abasing lessons. God brings you up, God brings you down. He's writing from prison. Who put Paul in prison, by the way? Same person that cast Jonah in the sea. <laughs> Who put Paul in prison? God had a greater plan for him. I used to enjoy preaching about Charles Spurgeon. I really loved it. I studied his life for more than 45 years and I'd preach about it and I'd say things Spurgeon said. I just loved it. And I quoted often this expression Spurgeon used. He said, the greatest thing God ever blessed a man with is health unless he blessed him with physical weakness. That was such wonderful preaching. But dear God in heaven, it's been hard living hard living. Paul said, I know how to abound and I've learned how to be abased. I say, God bless you. Everywhere in all things, I am instructed. <laughs> Still learning, aren't we? Both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now, ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. And I love this, not because I desire a gift. I wish people could understand this but I desire fruit that ye may abound 
that may abound to your account. See, God's got a record and he wants you to have a good record. He wants you to have fruit on your account. He wants you to make deposits in heaven's bank. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Would you mark my God? Your need his riches by Christ Jesus. I was a very young fellow, maybe your age, maybe even a little younger. I went to hear the great preacher, B.R. Lakin. I'd never heard him. Oh, what a powerful preacher. He was a little aggravated because the crowd was so small, just a tiny group of people in a big, huge auditorium. At the end of the service, I walked up to him and said, Dr. Lakin, I'm so pleased to hear you. I've never heard you preach before. Oh, you have? No, I've never heard you preach before. But Dr. Raymond Smith, who invited you, invited me to come hear you and said you were the, one of the greatest preachers alive today. And he was, believe me. He preached on how I know there's a God. Nobody could preach it like him. And he reached over and picked up a long play album, a long play record album. <laughs> and pulled out a pen out of his pocket and tore the cover, the little cellophane cover off the paper so he could write on the album. And he wrote B.R. Lakin, Philippians 4.19. Now you won't believe this, but I wonder what is that Philippians 4.19? Why did he write that? That was his life verse. I'd never seen a life verse before. I never saw anybody do that. The preachers I ran with, they hardly know the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament, I guess. I don't know. But he wrote Philippians 4.19. I couldn't wait to get away from him to open my Bible and see what it said. Here's what it said. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I said, if that's a good enough life verse for B.R. Lakin, that's going to be my life verse. I had that verse all through college and all through seminary and early in my marriage. And then I got so, so deep in the battle that I thought, Lord, have mercy. I thought I was engaging in just some friendly worship and this is a real warfare. And I laid down that verse and picked up Acts 5.42 because I needed to cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you, it's a good place to start right here with Philippians 4.19 because God wants you to learn of his provision. Let me tell you something. It sounds silly, but my wife and I have prayed for tires on our car when I was your age. And I went to a place and found what used tires cost. I could get four tires for $40, $10 a piece. Only problem is I didn't have $40. And we prayed. Because I was afraid to ride my family around, the old ball tires, the strings, and all that was coming out on the thing. But we prayed. And lo and behold, we went to the mailbox one day, and there was two $20 bills in it. And I ran to the car, and I drove to the used tire place, and said to the dear man there, I'd like those four used tires we were looking at the other day. And I recognize God sent those two $20 bills. You won't believe this, but it's true. My wife prayed for an amount of money we needed. It wasn't a lot of money, but prayed for the dollars and the cents. Just to be specific, it came to that exact amount. And God proved he provided all our need. Did I say you there's a learning process? It was a struggle for me to start out praying for $40, two $20 bills. Now we're praying for millions. If somebody said to me, you're going to be praying for millions someday, I'd have thought, you've lost your mind. You, you've really lost your mind. But you learn. 
And you learn it's the same thing, trusting God, increased faith, increased vision, believing God, learning, learning. It's a learning process. I must give you this. I want you to write this down. But my God shall supply all your need. Notice, according to, not out of, but according to his riches. What kind of riches does he have? Would you write this down? Write the book of Romans. Romans. Are you writing? His riches. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. The riches of his goodness. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. That's what God provides from the riches of his goodness. Turn to Romans chapter 11 and verse 33. Write it down. You're going to need it. Believe me, you're going to need it. Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He has the riches of his wisdom. So I don't know. Listen. You say, I don't know. Listen. God knows the riches of his wisdom. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, if you would, please. And listen to this carefully. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of his sins, according to the riches of his grace. The riches of his grace. Isn't that amazing? The riches of his grace. Look at chapter 1, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You're learning. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The riches of his glory. The riches of his grace. Now listen again. Are you listening? But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches, the riches of his goodness, the riches of his wisdom, the riches of his grace, the riches of his glory. His bank's full. And you don't deplete one thing by getting all of it you need. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Paul said, I've learned. You've learned, I've learned. Continue the things which thou hast learned. And we learn of his person. We begin there and stay there. We learn of his peace. Everything's coming apart, coming unglued all around. Seems like people have gone crazy. Turned everything upside down. Called light, darkness, and darkness, light. They think you good guys are the mean guys, and the mean guys are the good guys. What in the world is going on? You have to weather this storm. You have to weather this storm. So you go through this learning process and you learn of his peace. And then you get so challenged, you think, I'm at wit's end. Good, that's a great place to get, Psalm 107. You can't figure it out anymore. But you're going through the learning process and you learn of his provision. And he truly becomes a miracle-working God. The greatest journey anyone ever takes is the journey they take with God. The most tremendous adventure in life is your walk with the Lord. And it's a learning process. It's ascending, not descending. Oh, you'll see like you're descending sometime. Your old body will start talking to you. I didn't know I had a body until I was 40 years old. I didn't know I had a body. I didn't pay attention to it until I was 40 years old. Then it started talking to me, telling me, better take care of that. And your body starts speaking. And it seems like it seems like you're descending, but inside. You take care of your body, but inside. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is ascending. 
growing, jumping up and down, leaping, venturing out, taking the challenge. Someday this ascending life will reach the top floor and when the elevator door opens, we'll be looking into the face of Jesus Christ. There's a learning process. It never stops. Let's pray, may we?